bringing you another fine podcast from Art Report Today. Hello, art lovers. This is Gordy Grundy, and our guest today is a Los Angeles-based sculptor. Eric Johnson was born in Southern California. He attended the California Institute of the Arts and earned his MFA at the University of California, Irvine. With his knowledge of fabrication, Eric has long been a problem solver for other artists such as Tony DeLapp, John Paul Jones, Craig Kaufman, and a few others. Today we will discuss the great fabricator Jack Brogan, materials, processes, and the art of making art. Well, let's talk about Brogan and his secrets. Oh, Jack has held those secrets pretty close to the vest for a long time. And uh, a lot of people have been trying to, you know, get out of how he does this and that. If you go to his shop and he's working and you know how you do all that, you can see what he's doing. You know, you well, can uh, reverse engineer what he what he does. But a lot of his secrets are in his chemistry. He's got a great mind. Um, and he's not going to tell anybody, you know, amounts of measurements and that sort of stuff, but in the last couple of years, we've gotten, uh, when we talk, we, I guess about a year and a half ago, he just changed subjects. Instead of talking about race cars and artists and stuff, he just shifted right into, you know, what would I do in this situation? Uh, you know, and then we just started talking about that, and that was a, you know, a different level that I've ever talked to anybody on, because uh, nobody knows what Jack knows, you know, not even myself. So you'd really never had a conversation like that before with him? No, not at all. He was always very guarded. But we were, most of the time we were, you know, with other people, Dwayne Valentine, Craig Kaufman, you know, all of those other people. And, right. And, uh, you know, he's just very, uh, you know, he's a gracious gentleman. And uh, But when we were, we started, you know, hanging out alone with each other, um uh, you know, it always it was always you know the how do you do and what's happening as a family and everything, and then he would like to jump into uh, you know a technical aspect and how would I solve a problem, and in turn I would do the same. You know, I'd call him when I was confused about something and what did he do, and and uh, ironically we had a lot of the same solutions. Um, you know, I'm coming at it from an automotive point of view, and he's coming at it through the arts, and, and I'm not sure where his roots started with, but uh, a lot of the, you know, the, the uh, fabricated work of, you know, Billy Allen Banks and McCracken, Valentine, and all those guys really has a lot of its roots in the automotive and this aerospace industry. Now, when we say secrets, how do we kind of define that? Well, you know, it's, it's sort of like uh, it really is. It is part of the arts that it would be like like oil painters would have in the 16th century. It would be kind of that same level where a mixture of wet pigments and um, you know and uh, how how much what the proportion of of uh, you know of, of polyester would you have you know in a in a mixture. Um, and that's kind of like, you know, that would be secret for Jack, because obviously uh, the people he's been doing work for forever, you know, as soon as you give somebody a little bit of knowledge, like, a, a, you know, a Mary Course or somebody like that, then they're going to think they can go get somebody else to do it. And that's just, you know, that's putting tools in the wrong hands a lot of times. So when we say secrets, it's really just a matter of what's at hand for the project. Yeah, it's not really it's not really a secret. I've I've always had this thing where where people come to the studio and we're doing something weird, and I go, you know, by the end of this project, we're going to be experts. <laughs> and every project's a different one. You know, you figure it out as you go. The fact is, is that he would have solutions uh, that would work in different, you know, in different ways. And and I think where Jack and I got along was is that I. My philosophy is, is that when you restore something, it needs to look like a car can, comes right off the showroom floor, not like it's been redone. So you go to those specs, and Jack feels the same way. So really, when we say formula, are there formulas, or is that just a matter of... There are formulas. Um, 
you know, and the, the person that probably has the tightest formula is a ball is Dwayne Valentine. Mm-hmm. Um, year, years ago, before the, um, you know, the standard, Pacific Standard Time, Dwayne gave me his scale and his pour record for pouring different things. And it was sort of, it was more like a mathematician's log. I mean, it was almost undiscernible. And then when he had the, the show there, the Getty won it, he asked me for it back, and I go, of course you can have it back, it's yours, you know. Or I have four records for what I do, and I keep it, it's pretty uh, easy to access. And with Jack, I don't know if he has written down records. Uh, I tend to not think so. He just has so much knowledge in his head. So really every every situation is different. Most of the time it's different materials, and temperature really is different. Uh, like with resins, you know, one of the reasons why it really can't go outside effectively is that it has no real binder in it. Uh, and as one side gets heated up by the sun or whatever, it can fracture the, you know, cause fissures and cracks because it's expanding at such a rate. Um, so repairing that stuff can have different, different solutions. It calls for different times, different solutions. Now you've done most of, uh, Tony DeLapp's work, correct? Correct. Well, I've not done most of it. I built a great deal of his work over a 10 year period. Right, and it, and for about a four or five year period, I built everything that pretty well that came out of the studio. Um, how does your work in resin differ with Jack's? Well, I would say there's probably you know what what he how he restores a piece or whatever would be pretty well the same. We're arriving at the same place at a very similar you know time and element. Um, you know, I use all of my materials are automotive based, and I. Turned uh, uh, Jack on to a, a mutual friend, Jay Gospinetic. He owned a paint company in San Francisco. I don't know how many years ago, five, six, eight, eight years ago, or whatever. So he was buying all of his materials from from uh, from Jay. Well, before that, Jay was working with Dupont, and Dupont was using me for uh, uh, testing. You know, they'd give me materials, and then I would test it, and I would get back to Jay, and Jay got back to them. But the, but as far as the materials go, you know, the, it's it all kind of is the same stuff, it, and it's really not that hard to work with. You just you just have to adhere to the rules of, of resin. You really can't monkey around with it like you can oil paint and water paint and stuff. It 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 has a it has a it has rules. You know, too much catalyst it becomes brittle. Too little catalyst it's too pliable. I just I restored some. Uh, Peter Alexander's earlier this year, and it didn't have, and he made them in '67 or '9 or something, and he didn't put enough catalyst in it, and they were, they were like, like Abba Zappa bars, you know, if you picked it up, it'd be thin. <laughs> um, what if, you know, how did Jack get to where he is today in terms of his education and his, I don't know, just knowledge of materials? Well, you know, I don't know, but I, gosh, I, you know what, I did know what Jack was. Don, it was he a uh, I don't know if he was an engineer or machinist or something, and don't quote me on that because I don't know exactly, but I did know. Unfortunately, you know, as time goes by, we forget shit. But, but he went about it as a, as a real, uh, uh, as a real a chemistry solution. And there, you know, this is the components. This is what, this, the solvents. This is what the binders are. And he worked that way towards it, which really nobody did. Um, you know, in the past, uh, the artists don't really care about all that stuff. We just care if it works or not. Um, and I would have to say that I didn't care about it that much. I just could figure out what worked and what didn't. But to tell you why, I, I wouldn't have really known. But Jack would know why it worked. You know, why did that uh, polystyrene, that amount of it work in one situation and, and, uh, and not in another? Well, you in many ways, aren't you kind of the only guy that Jack could really talk to? You know, that, he he said that, and it that was very surprising. It's like, you know, the funny thing happened on the way to the forum. I didn't certainly didn't set out to be that guy that that knew about all that stuff, but I really was overwhelmingly fascinated. My father built uh, Corvettes or repaired Corvettes in the 60s for Chevrolet in the Valley, and I just, you know, got, got interested in it, but he... Uh, I think probably about eight months ago we were talking, and he goes, you're really kind of the only guy that understands what I'm talking about. 
and that that's I guess the crux of our conversations that it was uh, almost really for the first time in my life I didn't feel like I was boring somebody when I told them about you know if you use this much catalyst at this kind of temperature you're going to get a better a less color shift and more of a true color you know when the, when it dries and stuff and Jack was right on it you know he would come back with a it's sort of like almost like mathematicians, you know, with uh, you know scrolling or um, you know on a chalkboard. It was it was very enjoyable. Well, that's a heck of a compliment uh, to you. I th- I think so, and I and I took it very seriously in that manner. Yes, I did. I mean, I guess the question would would be to ask would be what's going to happen with all of the pieces that are uh, in collections all around the world when when there are when people are not able to restore them properly anymore. You know, there's yeah. people out there that can do all of this stuff, but but it would almost, it's almost like a, a think tank. Jack was his own private think tank. You know, you send the work to him. He, he knows the history of it. He knows the people. And that's part of it, too. It's sort of, you know, it's like being uh, shipbuilders. You know, you know the people or the shipbuilders or the race car builders. You know the crew. You know the people. You know what they do. So you don't have to wonder what you know, and how they put it together, you can reverse engineer it in that manner because you know it's predictable. But you know, youngsters, let's say some youngster in five, ten years from now really wants to take it on in a true, honest way. How is he going to know, or she going to know exactly what they're doing? Is what happens. Serious working with uh, plastics. Well, you know, succession has been a, a constant question in, in the community. I mean, you know. What will happen when Jack is officially retired and, you know, traveling the world? Well, who knows? And I mean, and, and, you know, God forbid when Jack is no longer able to answer questions. I mean, that's, right. that's the really sad part because I, I enjoy calling up Jack and asking him, like, you know, what would you do in this situation? Like I had a Craig Kaufman that needed, I needed a filler for the, for the plexiglass and he gave me the, uh, the material right away. He just sent me the, information on a material that I could use as a bondo, but it's clear. Where else am I going to get that information? It's sort of like, you know, when you asked your grandmother or your grandfather about something when you were, you know, going through puberty, you knew you could trust them as an answer. You know, you just don't ask strangers stuff that they don't know, you know. Right. Now, you said something interesting the other day about apprentices and, and people who are interested in learning about the alchemy. Yeah, um, well, in, you know, all through in the last 20 years, I've had people, uh, you know, come and want to learn how to do, you know, resin and plastic and fiberglass and all that. And, and in the 90s, in the early 2000s, it was guys that wanted to come. And these were all guys that really, you know, had careers or they were uh, accomplished artists and they applied that work to their what they were doing. And right about... 2010, the, all of those kind of guys, you never even saw them anymore, and uh, and women start coming forward with, with careers, not with careers, and wanted to understand the chemistry of it, and they were really much better students. They really, it's almost like they didn't have some kind of beginning knowledge, like, you know, in automotives or motorcycles and stuff that they, they were asking better questions. Interesting. Because, yeah, it, it is really interesting. I think that says a lot about our times. I, I really do think it does. Um, and I've talked to other people in businesses, and they're oh yeah, the you know the younger women, if they really want to learn something, they really put their mind to it. Has Jack ever had a likely successor, or that just has never happened? Huh? No, it never happened. We toyed with that, uh, you know, six months ago. Uh, I was going up there, and we were, and and frankly, it was just, you know, we both waited too long because we had actually talked about it 10, 15 years ago, you Mm -hmm. know, and kind of joking around, but it got serious, um, you know, serious conversation with Chris Griswold and uh, Rochelle Ravonk, Dwayne Valentine, and myself about 10 years ago, and it was sort of like, what's going to happen when, you know, when... Jack and I were no longer able to do it, and sort of everybody just shook their heads, and we dropped it. But in the last year or so, Jack and I have talked about it, but 
it's I would need Jack to be available 100 percent you know and it's really difficult you know at his age and his commitments for him to to do that right but there's so much of his I mean there's no way I could ever touch I will never know 10 percent of his knowledge well this is fascinating stuff and it's History right that's happening right now. This is wild. Yeah, you know, and they're probably you know, and you know, there's people out there that can that could step right in and really help, but but they have to have you know they have to have an art degree. They have to understand what art is. They have to understand what uh, abstract art is and what materials came out of World War Two, and then they have to have a work ethic, and that work ethic has to entail automotive. Uh, that, that's a that's a hell of a combination. You're talking about, it's like a baseball, a five-tool player. How do you get a rookie five-tool player that's not have other things on their plate? And nowadays, right. it's so expensive for youngsters to survive. You know, you'd have to pay them so much. I've had people say, why don't you get people to come and help you, Eric? Well, if they knew what I knew, they should be working for themselves, and I otherwise I couldn't afford to pay them. Right. And I think that's what happens with Jack. You just can't afford to depend and you know and, and uh, pay people that don't have full knowledge or that really want to follow through. There, there's no apprentice program, you know, in the United States that I'm aware of that would allow for something like this. Right. Some really filthy rich people would step in and go, okay, we got to capture this and we got to do something right now, and then pick up two or three. There are some good uh, resident artists in L.A. To pick up two or three people and say, we'll pay you X amount of money to come in and, and work here and tell us everything you're doing and work with Jack. That's yeah. the only way to really survive. Um, on that same note, I mean, you you know, the difference between creation and restoration, um, that's got to be a pretty big, wide. No, I don't think it's that wide. I think it's, it's a really clear cut. When you're restoring something, you go to the original specs of what it was. Now, if you're working with, let's say, if you're working with Jackson Pollock, you know, it, it has two things. That there's a wide margin there, but you would have a lot of photographic imagery that would tell you what you can and can't do and the chemistry of it. Um, if you're, I, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear cut. You just have to go by, your ego has to stay out of all of that stuff. When I, when I work on Tony's work, I try to make it to where everything. If he's got, if he's known for using his left hand with with crooked staples on one area, that I do that. I just mimic that. And then with Kaufman's work, I just mimic what Craig would have done. Now, when oh. people like myself that knew those people intimately are gone, how do you do that? How do you tell people that? Right. There's just no way. We're even asking these questions. I mean, this is, I hate to say it, but it's far too late in a lot of ways for people to be asking these questions. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I always assumed that the restoration aspect, just the matching of materials would have been extremely difficult. It, it, it is. It can be. The, the, the grace period about with that is, is that uh, there's several different pigments that can come up with the same, that that wind up in the same direction and you just have to find what I was speaking about earlier the color shift because of the chemistry and plastics and resin and painting there's a color shift with the heat that can be involved or the or the time duration uh, you just have to be able to blend the two it's it's, a, it's kind of a it's a it's almost like a perfect illusion to where okay you, you're matching something that was made in the mid 60s so you have to match it now, and you do not want the colors to shift and go out of tune later, 10, 20, 50 years from now. So you really have to understand those materials and what they use, but you can use modern pigments and come up with the same thing. Now, I have a lot of a lot of the pigments that were used originally, uh, Ron Davis's and and uh, uh, Craig Kaufman and Eric Orr and those people, I still have those original pigments. Wow. So, when I'm gone, when Jack's gone, he's got a ton of that stuff. What do you do with that stuff? You know, we both know in our head exactly what what went where and and what percentages they were. You know, because you 
you have you do percentages on on your mixtures when you're painting or when you're on your restoring. It's a different percentage. You know, it's no big deal, but it, but it is. It will be a shame when it's gone. It, it's certainly, especially when you come into you know you're dealing with the solvents and dryers and things like that. Well, you know, to bring this back around, it's um, it had to be a pretty good feeling to be able to talk to Jack on that level, huh? It it really was, and it was something that that I felt good about because we've known each other for a long, long time. But for yeah. him to, you know, to think of me as someone that he could confide in and and tell things, and <laughs> and we had all kinds of great talks about artists and their capabilities and their non capabilities. Oh my God, that's a that's a a whole bunch of stuff that I'll always keep to myself. <laughs> And here we should end our conversation with sculptor Eric Johnson with the secrets that he must keep. This has been a sobering conversation about a time which has run out, about a mythical place, Los Angeles, which no longer really exists, and a living history that is now confined to the page. How will we cherish our treasures when there is no one with the knowledge or the ability to conserve them? I doubt YouTube has the answer. This is Gordy Grundy for Art Report Today. This has been a production of Art Report Today. Find your inspiration in the arts every day at artreporttoday.com.